on contemporary Orthodox stories, the Viva versus the Didic, with Mari Lowe and Arthur Levine. Um, we hope you'll explore our other events today. We have 32 going on, and we have 85 speakers we hope you can get your book signed at one of our 72 author signings. Um, next time you visit, make sure to check out our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, as well as Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Scholler. We also have our Garden of Stones outside, which is just next to our Locks Cafe, which is open today. Um, and then we do have an upcoming exhibition next fall on the Danish Rescue for Families. On the what? The Danish Rescue. Oh, the Danish Rescue. Yes. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. And then you can pick up um, holiday gifts and books in our Picking Museum shop on our Visitor Services Center on the main level. Um, and we hope you'll share your feedback with us on our post-festival survey. And we are encouraging masking today. Um, this program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority, and your donations also help us present these programs, so thank you. And this event is co-presented by Levine Cornell Books. Um, so now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Mari Lowe has too little free time and spends it all on writing in escape rooms. <laughs> As the daughter of a rabbi and a middle school teacher at an Orthodox Jewish school, she looks forward to sharing little glimpses into her community with her books. Her debut novel, Aviva vs. Divic, was named Best Book of the Year by NPR and received three-star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and Arthur A. Levine is the president and editor-in-chief of Levine Cordo, a vibrant new independent publisher distributed by Chronicle Books. Levine Cordo is born as a fervent mission to give voice to its uniquely talented, exceptionally diverse group of authors and artists, a career-long passion of its founder. <laughs> Um, the book will be available for purchase at our bookstore, and then you can get it signed by Mari upstairs following the talk. So, without further ado, please enjoy the event. <laughs> So I, I also happen to be probably the only editor in the United States who can say he published a young adult translation from the Danish about this, the subject of next week's talk. <laughs> I did. Um, it's a niche. But, yeah, that's a niche, right. But is that the book that was upstairs? It wasn't. It's, I, it was from my time at Scholastic. It's called Almost Autumn. Oh, I remember um, that one. Mariana Corrin. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, right? Um, we are here today to talk about you, Mari. Oh, boy. We just, we just met today, first of all. I mean, it's in the way of editors and authors, you just do most of your interactions through writing. Um, and so it's always nice to get a, a face. And a, I, have, have we spoken? We might have spoken once. I don't think so. I was always yeah. very intimidated. So even when you like mentioned, oh, we could call email. We could, so we could like, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> but, and the other nice thing is that I, I recognize all of you from, from today. So I, I feel like we're just kind of in the living room having a chat. Um, this doesn't feel, doesn't feel so like, Formal, um, but why don't I jump in and ask you questions? Okay, so Mari, in a draft of your newest book, an eleven-year-old character makes a reference to not being able to find Jewish books to read for pleasure, as opposed to the vast majority of books she could find in her local library. Would it be fair to say that it, it's an experience you yourself have had, or the kids you teach? So, it's interesting. It's gotten better over the years, I will say. When I was a kid, there really wasn't much. Like, there were Jewish books. There was like, all of a kind family, and you know, a lot of books had a random Jewish character thrown in and said something about Hanukkah at some point in the book, you know? <laughs> But there wasn't really much in the way of like books about my Orthodox Jewish experience, and there and there were like two series out there, and I was something someone who loved fantasy and science fiction, and I didn't want to just read you know contemporary books, although I, I do enjoy writing them yeah. um, and reading them now. But back then, I wanted to like I wanted to kind of broaden my horizons a little bit, and you really didn't have that um, back then. You really didn't have much variety. You didn't have really anything that stepped outside of like this tiny little line because the truth is the publishers, the Orthodox Jewish publishers who work, you know, with non-mainstream even, this is just within the Orthodox Jewish world, they're all, um, they have to appeal to everyone because they've got to sell books and they've got a really small group. So you, the kids could not ever do anything that would be like rude. They could not do anything that they didn't learn from if it was negative. It was like very like, here are our 
beautiful, sweet girls doing beautiful, sweet things, and that's all you're gonna get. <laughs> so that was always very frustrating to me, and I read other things. I would, you know, occasionally I'd pick up, uh, they were BY Times and the Baker's Dozen, and I remember there were some mysteries that were okay. I think I mentioned that in the book, like mm -hmm. Deborah Dorish, I remember I liked those mysteries, but they were from the 80s, like maybe even older. Um, there really was not a lot of variety, and there really wasn't much to read. So even today, I would say like that that business is booming a little more. There are, you know, the publishers are much more willing to, the Orthodox Jewish publishers are more willing to put out Orthodox Jewish books, but it's also very much like if you finish a book, they'll publish it as long as it is nothing objectionable. So there isn't much quality control. Yeah, so yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, so I, I, we're just working on the next book, so I, I kind of just wanted to talk about that. <laughs> like, oh yeah, you know, we did that. Spoiler! <laughs> but um, I don't think I'm spoiling much to say, I'm not reading this off my script, but one of the things I thought was so cool about the next novel <coughs> is that it, it is framed, like the approach to Yom Kippur is, the, is what drives the narrative. So that is a very intensely Jewish thing that, that is so recognizable, um, that kind of accept, that self-examination, you know, leading to the, the countdown, leading to the deadline. I, I'm, I'm going to be really interested um, to hear the response to that. But it's just something that, that I don't think I... Even so, I'm like 150 years older than you, and I also, you know, this is that you was. You look a day over 30. <laughs> Your check is in the mail. <laughs> no, but it, even growing up, I, I think it's interesting to hear you talk about um, fantasy that way too, because I think I just accepted the idea that no book would ever be about me. You know, I would never see myself in a book. Um, I would never read a book that had, you know, teshuva as like the thing that the characters were really engaging. Um, so, I mean, I find it very moving even to work with you on it. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that Aviva versus the Dybbuk was, you know, equally like astonished, like revelatory to me because I never, just absolutely never read um, a book that took for granted that this was an, in an Orthodox community. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna lose it. I'm losing my focus because I'm getting so emotional about her book. Um, <laughs> but I wanna say, by the way, I don't think I would have been able to publish by anyone else, without anyone who was specifically looking for that because it's, it's not something that editors are willing to take a chance on. But I guess I think that comes up later. So. <laughs> no, let's, let's, let's go with that, because I, I, think, that's, I, I think that's interesting to hear. Um, because I think it does connect to the, I'm gonna call it a controversy, that it's not a controversy with me, or probably with any of us, but there's somewhat of a controversy over whether we and our experiences should be counted um, as part of equity and inclusion, which uh, to me mostly makes me extremely angry <laughs> because uh, I think it, it's a, it, it, it trades in stereotypes about you know, Jews controlling the media and, um, and all of that, when in fact, my own experience, as I was just saying, um, is, is not one of seeing myself. So, where was I going with that? <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me, let me put it a different way. So, your path, you, just, you were mentioning your path to publication, like that um, your, your wonderful agent, Tamar, um, hey. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of want to bring her into this too, but like <coughs> directed your manuscript to me. But what, what was the larger context of your road to publication? 
So, I mean, I was very fortunate in terms of agents because from the start I wanted to mark. And I didn't actually query her at first because I was like, I'm not, I'm not jumping into this. I'm not, I don't want to even like, you know, write you off right away. And then I was so fortunate because I think you know, Tamar is someone who is already in the community, who understands the community, and who could relate to the book, which I discovered was a very difficult thing. Because we had, you know, there were a lot of people who were interested. Everyone's interested. Oh, this is something new, this is something different, Orthodox Jewish girl, contemporary. And then the responses, both I think from agents and from editors, were often things like, well, we just, we couldn't connect. We couldn't connect. And I know that's like a stock thing that they say often, yeah. but sometimes the the thing itself, like it wasn't necessarily a um, what, what's the word? form response. It was they genuinely couldn't connect because there was something unconnectable there. Because not only is the Orthodox Jewish experience something that's different, it's also not something that's really been addressed before. So it's not like they had some context for it within um, the media or within other books they read. It just was something so foreign to them that it felt like another world. They publish books about other worlds all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but and that is so you know, I, I framed it differently, but that's actually exactly the response that I have. Um, that that's what connects um, Jewishness and Jewish identity with other previously underrepresented identities. And this is the same um, problem with the you know the black community and and I don't know the gay community and. You know, the folks would send in their manuscripts, and the primarily white Christian, you know, majority that is is viewed as what people read to um, would say, I can't connect to this. And part of the, and, and then it's a vicious cycle because then folks from different backgrounds aren't drawn into publishing, and you still don't have people who are relating. Um, but did you, did you know that in, a, like, was that, how did you know that in advance? Like, know that it, it might be, it, you, you actually got letters back that said, I can't? So I remember when I was looking for an agent, I had, maybe I sent out like 20 requests, and I got something like eight hits early on, and I thought, that was it. I hadn't even like sent it to you yet at that point. And I was like, oh, wow, there's so much interest. This is really, and then I just kept getting these responses. They were very complimentary. They were very positive. And, but ultimately, there was just this kind of, they don't connect. And I think that's, you know, that's something now. It's, it, how can you connect to something that, if you're expecting it to be contemporary, you're expecting it to be about this world and not fantasy, I guess their feeling was, I just don't know this. I don't know this. Because I, I would say that the way in to the book is, is you know, it's not hidden. It's not a hidden sign. I mean, um, it, it's about a, a girl and, and her Ima dealing with grief. Um, which Lord knows is an, a universal experience. Um, so, I don't know. I, I do think that, that what you're saying about that being a coded response is very true. It's just, you know, I don't relate. Sorry, and that and that it's. I think it's meant um, when it's sent out to be like a kind of impersonal, um, like don't take this personally. I just can't relate to who you are or where you come from. <laughs> I mean, but that's cool, right? <laughs> right, right. I, but I, I think it's really interesting that we that we, we, I'm going to say we in the publishing era, uh, publishing side, like don't often examine the effects of those stock phrases and, and how they're interpreted. I, for me, it's partly getting those as an author. Like, I'm like, well, this really sucks. <laughs> you know, um, you know I, I didn't... <laughs> I wasn't writing about you, so um, anyway. Uh, so my next question was really about. It seems obvious that uh, this rich. One of the things that I loved about the, I loved about mm -hmm. the view of the Divic was the rich 
cultural and familial and community um, that you represented, I, I would say created because it's not nonfiction. Um, and were you just able to, to draw on your, these were your own experiences? So it's interesting, my father is a rabbi, and I mean, it's a bend the bio, but the thing about him is he's a congressional rabbi, and he sees a lot of people, and I, he lives in a neighborhood that's like a very affluent neighborhood, the five towns, if you've heard of it. <laughs> um, and you have a lot of very affluent people, and you also have a lot of people who are really struggling. And I hear him telling these stories, like he just, one time he was at my house and he's casually telling me, he's like, yeah, we do this thing, you know, sometimes where I give, you know, random guy in his, uh, you know, in his uh, shul, I give him, you know, a job, this is it. He is going to pay this person's rent for the next year. And, and then he's telling me that, yeah, and then we have them pay it back slowly. And then a couple of months in, we just tell them, oh, you know, you've been so good at this, it's done. You know, you don't need to pay any more back, it's over. And things like that. He'll be giving, you know, he'll be giving a, a shear, like a, a, he'll be learning with people. And, um, and in the middle of that, he'll get a phone call from, you know, someone who just got laid off or something like that, or just someone who needs something. Sometimes it's just things like sending kids to summer camps so that they don't feel different than all their friends. And he'll just like point to people, be like, okay, how much you gonna give? How much you gonna give? How much you gonna give? And they just give, and they give, and they give. And like, I grew up in a community of people who give and people who take care of each other, and so much so. And I think that's really one of the really beautiful things about an Orthodox community. You're so tight-knit, you really know who needs what. We spend a lot of time together, so you can see. And people reach out. My mother organized like a single women's um, support group for a long time, where you know it was little things like, um, these were single mothers who, you know, who had kids, and sometimes there are things that a father would go to normally, so they would have stand-ins, or they would give people jobs who needed it, you know, things like that, and it's, it's a, an ever-present thing in my life, and something I've always experienced, and even if you go all the way back to my father, when he was a kid, he was not a religious Jew at all, his parents were not religious, he, they sent him to first grade in Howth, in Long Beach, um, just because they figured he should know the olive face, he should know Hebrew. The principal, a Holocaust survivor, sat down with him 10 minutes every day at lunch and taught him everything he needed to know so he wouldn't feel stupid. Like, it's just little things like that, just this constant support in this community. And that's, that's something that, like, I just, it's really, really special to me and really important to me. And that was really, like, I think one of my number, number one, I guess I had a few, but one of the number one things that I set out to do with Aviva was just to kind of portray the beauty of a community like that, where people take care of each other, people see each other. Yeah. Um, how, how many of you have, have read Aviva versus the Vivid? Okay, some of you haven't, so uh, I have to figure out a way to say this without giving things away. <laughs> but there are certain parts of Aviva versus the Divic, you know, when you're an editor, you read things many times. You know, that's just the nature of, of, the, of the, the work. Um, there's this one part uh, that I can't even, I, I'm going to get choked up just thinking about it. I've told you about this, right? Do you, the, it's, you might, in, in some, you might in some ways think it's a, it's a small um, moment um, because it's not between Aviva and her mother, which is the central relationship. It's not between Aviva, a memory of Aviva and her father. It's with Aviva and an, another adult from the community um, who Aviva confesses something to her. And the, the, woman, the woman who hears it says, don't, don't worry, we actually have known all along. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know, I got your right? 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have to give you credit also, because one other thing you mentioned then was the economic diversity in, in, within any Jewish community. But within this, I, I really appreciated that you acknowledged that. I think that that is a myth about Jews that is very broadly accepted, that we're, we're all wealthy. 
Right, right. We're all about the money. Still waiting for my payday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not You're right. a teacher. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I thought, was that, did you do that consciously? Yeah, I think so. I think it's something that, I mean, it comes up a little bit in the next one too, here and there, just like in tiny bits, maybe not as much. One hour. Yeah. But, um, but um, it's, I think it's, it's just there's always a sort of division, and it's not one that kids are necessarily conscious of, but I see it. I'm saying I teach 150 girls a year, and as they come from very different backgrounds, and sometimes you get like a message from the school, something like, don't ask this girl why she doesn't have a pencil or something, you know, do not be in contact with her about not, you know, not being prepared for something. And you know, like there are, you know, there are some girls who are, there are some families that are really, really struggling and some that aren't. And I felt that, you know, with Aviva in particular, this would be a family where they don't have things for obvious reasons, if you read the book. But um, there are, and it's not, it's something that, you know, and then you also, you have lots of people who have a lot and we kind of, it's, if you go back to the Middle Ages, you actually, or even before the Middle Ages, you actually see they used to have these communal taxes on Jewish towns. It would be like, okay, this percentage of your earnings go to, you know, orphans. This percentage of your earnings go to the poor. This percentage of your earnings, and I think that's, you know, that's something that we've always had. Where we, in any capitalist society, you're going to have people who are, um, who have, and people who do not have. And I think it's important to kind of note both of those, and also those note how what we can do for both sides, right. from both, from one to the other. Yes. But you know, which in in a, if I may, in a, in the context of Orthodox Judaism, is actually a, a you know a mitzvah. It's like mm -hmm. you you should. This is something that is like incumbent upon you, yeah. not like a nice mm -hmm. you know. Yes, yeah. it's a nice thing, but it's also like yeah, it's ten percent of your earnings, no matter what, are going to other Jews, and you don't even like see them as your own. Like I know we have a separate bank account where ten percent automatically goes, and I don't even like. It's not mine. I've never thought of it as mine. It's only a question of where do I get it. Yes. Well, I think the world at large doesn't know about that. And, and also the world at large really doesn't have a, a sense of, of Jewish diversity. So, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know if you ever saw yourself as an Orthodox person being part of Jewish diversity, but you are, and, and what you've represented very much is, too. Um, oh, here's something different. Um, I really loved learning about Mahanaim. <laughs> so, and it, it's funny about the, when you talk about fantasy, I think that those who have never played Mahanaim or seen it played, kind of think of it as like Quidditch. <laughs> you know, it's like... I that, do have a friend who plays Quidditch. You do, like some people have managed, but I, I think that for people who don't encounter it, they're like, wow, this cool fantasy game, you know? But you, this is a game that you probably see played all the, you know, every day on the right. playgrounds. Yes, I'm terrible at it, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I'm very good at like basketball, hockey, soccer, I once broke someone's finger playing hockey, like oh, very aggressive right. player. Mach and I, that's a scary ball. <laughs> it's a dodgeball, so it's big, heavy, and tough. But the coolest thing is, I mean, I, I teach, so we go upstairs sometimes and they play on the roof and it's, it's like this timid little, you know, mousy girl who, like, you never saw as, you know, like, someone who even puts herself out there or speaks in class. She is hurling that ball. <laughs> and, like, maybe, you know, a bigger, more awkward girl. And, like, she's just planted there. She is the powerhouse. And it's the girls you wouldn't expect. It's the people who, like, who really you don't see as someone more outgoing and someone maybe even more athletic. But Machanayim just has, it's a, it's a game about, you know, it's just anyone can excel. What I really like about it is it's about collaboration. It's not about winning or losing. I mean, at the end it is. But that in dodgeball, let's say, when someone's out, they're out, right? Maybe they can go back in, depending on the rules. In Machanayim, the girls who are out, they wind up in the back. And they wind up still part of the team, still playing. There's no, you know, there's no one's getting shut out of the game at any point. And I really like that. I think that's, you know, something that it's, you know, it's something, I, I guess it feels very Jewish to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is like an exact example of what I talk about when I talk about getting to the universal through the specific. Um, like, 
I, I loved reading about these, you know, machanayim rivalries, and like, <laughs> everyone knows that this girl is the best, and this girl is the second best, and, you know, the, the team, the team rivalries, I, you know, that is, that's a universal experience of anyone who's played a sport. Um, but you're filtering it through a very specific lens, and that makes me see it more clearly. Because I'm not relying on my um, stereotypical or you know received images of sport. I'm kind of forced to see it um, more clearly, and that's that's something I really enjoy about your work and about this work. Um, here's the thing: Aviva has been praised by folks like the super influential librarian Betsy Bird who said it was like the best book she's ever read. I was like, literally, it, it took like 10 minutes for them to peel me off the floor. <laughs> Just because she's never said that about any book that, you know, that I've worked on. Um, and it, it's also been praised by the, the Jewish media that I'm aware of. I mean, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but has anything about the, the book's reception surprised you? Everything. <laughs> I, was, I remember I, I had a meeting with Irene um, early on, and she was like, she's like, yeah, we're going to submit it to this award, and we're going to you know, send it to the New York Times. And I was like, oh, my, my, this? <laughs> this? <laughs> I was like, but I would say I'm so gratified by the way that people have really been celebrating it and given it a chance. And you know, the star reviews and the people, I, Betsy Bird, that was an incredible review. And like just people really getting into it and willing to try with something totally new. It gives me a lot of hope in general for Orthodox Jewish books in the future, um, you know, that, that it has been well received. And I really owe that all to Levine Carino. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously I don't think it, it's, it's all Levine Carino, but I, I do wonder a bit if it wasn't that, if part of the, the our, our company's ability to um, present your work for what it is and for who you are is because we are also presenting other works from other cultures mm -hmm. as equally valid and interesting and important. And, you know, here this is. It's not exotic. It is this person's life and it's reflected in the story. Um, so I hope that. <laughs> I hope that you're actually a little right in that. I hope that we're 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 maybe um, finding a way to do that. Right. I think it it's not sold as a Jewish book. It's sold as a Levi Carrito book, and you also you know you do a lot with Native Americans mm -hmm. around the Latinx experience. Yep. And there's just kind of a variety there, but it's it's a general like here is a culture you might not know about. Rather than being like, oh, here, this is a Jewish book, we're going to go put it with other Jewish books in the little, you know, holiday section, and we'll sell it on Passover. <laughs> little box <Yes>. box. <laughs> Hanukkah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really important. Um, not, not stressing the humanity of, of, the, of the people in the book. Um, and not trying to do that by erasing what makes the person and their beliefs and their community special to them. So thank you for providing us with that opportunity. Well, thank you for taking it. Good question. Were you surprised? My That's my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was anonymous. <laughs> Were you surprised at the breadth of the reviews? I mean, I've looked at, you know, Tamara sent some of them to us, and I found some others. I mean, the breadth is very, very wide. Um, from Kirkus to Goodreads to, you know, librarian blogs and stuff like that. I was, I was very, very surprised. Were you surprised? Um, <laughs> Pleased. No, I understand um, that point. Not surprised, but I mean, I think there are there are people in this room that who have helped with that, mm -hmm. and I, I think I mean, I'm sorry to say you out, Rebecca, but you know, people in who are part of the librarian community and the Jewish community, or either or, um, 
I think this is something that we have tried very hard to accomplish as a publishing company. Mm -hmm. And it's a little different because this is our mission. It's not sort of like a little function, um, you know, that somebody does down the hall, you know, along with, I, th I think you'll, you find it a, a, an uncommon experience for authors because most publicity departments and publicists are, have like 150 books a list to publicize. <coughs> and what we really wanted to do is keep it to 15 books a list. Uh -huh. And then Smart. each, you know, each book has a publicist, in this case Irene Vasquez, and a marketing director, and they're working on this limited number of books so that they can try harder and be more imaginative and, and try to really think, you know, who should see this? Who might we know who might know other people who can see it? Right, but it, it, it's the people that I've seen some comments on who are not part of this world. They're a completely different milieu. And yet they see really nice things about this is, you know, teenage girls and young teenage girls. And I was very surprised. I, I read a lot and I was very surprised to see the breadth of the comments. Well, I'm really pleased about it too. But I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised because that's, uh, I know what I felt when I read the book. Um, and I'm, I said it, as I said in my other panel, I'm reconstructionist. Um, so I'm quite religious. But I'm not. I'm not Orthodox. Absolutely. You know, it's a different. It's a different community. Um, that didn't stop me from, you know, being super enthusiastic <laughs> <laughs> about the book. And you know, I'm. I'm not surprised that that many many people from many different backgrounds. I mean, e even within Living Querido, you know, we're not. Um, Am I the only Jewish person? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but we have various, you know, our intersectional um, connections um, are, are part of what makes us special, too. And, you know, I, I never, I don't, I had to think about it because I don't, I don't feel like exoticized or excluded as a Jew. Um, possibly because I own the company. <laughs> um, but no, I'm, I'm kidding. It's mostly because that's who we are, and we're a lot of, we, we're we not exactly alike, each, any of us. And so we're, we're, we feed off, you know, the energy that, that people like you provide, you know? Like, yes! And I mean, I do, I do feel, in a, in a funny way, um, e I feel that you are my community, even though I'm not Orthodox. Still, he's Jewish. Yes, yeah. 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 I'm Jewish. Um, but but the the whole of us feel, I think, invested in in every book that we do, and so I'm glad that we made your grandpa happy. <laughs> <laughs> that is our. He, he always no, write that down as the goal. <laughs> um, so, do you want to ask me any questions? Um, I was really just very curious. You spent you spent a lot of years at Scholastic at a, a big publisher. I did. And twenty three. Twenty three years. So that's like basically older than me. Not really. I know. But um, I wanted to know, you know, when you came out of that, you came to Living Carido and you created Living Carido. Yep. Um, but I want you. You mentioned something when you first emailed me about the book way back when. You said it was a book you had been looking for, and yes. I was really kind of curious about your experiences there and what you saw, and what you couldn't take, and what you could, and you know, and just kind of how it became a book that you were searching for. Um, well, I, I think that that uh, is longer, uh, <laughs> you know, than my tenure at Scholastic. I was <laughs> saying that I, you know, there. Are most parts of my Jewishness are, are not represented, you know, they they just aren't, um, and you know, I, I I'm 
I consider all parts of uh, Judaism to be connected to me. Um, and I had not seen a, a, an Orthodox. I, you know, I lived in Teaneck, um, <laughs> New Jersey for, for 12 years. Um, you know, I, I have lived among Orthodox people. Um, I, you know, I've had employees who are Orthodox, but I've never seen a book, a story. Um, so that's, that's what I meant. I do think that large publishers are handicapped sometimes by their um, need to not offend anybody. Um, you know, I think Diane alluded to this a little bit on our, our previous panel, but, you know, Scholastic has, has to please the book fairs. And the assumption is that the, the book fairs want books that are white and straight and Christian and, you know, and, and won't, so therefore. Or what they call offend. neutral. Yeah, that's, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 which I, I don't, right, I don't believe that. Um, so an editor there will have to, you know, have to overcome that um, in order to make a good case for Scholastic being the right publisher. You know, I, I was done, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, you know, because I, 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 don't, I don't believe that that is neutral. You know, it is something. It's not neutral, though. Um, and I, I had to make my own rules in order to do that. I think other big corporations, you know, one of the things that, that's come of the, to the conversation about equity and inclusion over the past 10 years even, has been the beginning of an examination of that idea, which for the majority of people who are from the majority um, have not had any reason to question this is the this is this is neutral. Um, I think that that's be, that's begun to expand. Yeah, definitely. The majority is changing, though. The majority is no, may no longer be the majority in, in a few years, right. and you're going to have to play to these niche markets. I suspect, rather than as you said, the white Christian middle class, uh, college educated in some cases. Well. My, my philosophy is that um, I, I play to book readers. And, you know, <laughs> yes, I, I'm unapologetic about that. I'm not trying to win anyone over, you know, necessarily. If they are, then I'm delighted. But I'm saying, here, look, this is a bunch of great books. Read them, enjoy, learn. Learn. Yeah. Learn a little, nothing wrong with a little learning for sure. Um, be entertained. Be moved. Um, you know, see see your own humanity and reflect it in whatever story this is. I thought he. I thought you were going to ask a question, but we're oh, just scratching. Oh, we'll go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm an aspiring children's author, a YA middle grade PV, what have you, and try, and I'm in the querying trenches right now, and I'm, I'm trying to work on multiple creative projects. So like, how do you keep your sanity <laughs> <laughs> trying to become an author? <laughs> or at least like, I'm a writer, but I'm not technically an author yet. Yeah. Semantics. Um, this for me. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll, I think, I'll jump honestly, in and help you also. <laughs> honestly, I have a sister-in-law going through this now too, and she's exhausted with it. And I would honestly say, just write something new as soon as you start querying something, because you'll be excited about the new thing by the time you're like, I mean, hopefully you won't, but if you get to the point, like, some people have one project that they're passionate about, and it's their whole life, and they, you know, they spend their whole life working on it, and then it's done, and there's, but that's it, that is their life project. I don't think that, you know, as an author, I don't think that's what you need to do. Uh, you know, I think it's, I mean, maybe it works for some people, and then they win the Pulitzer or whatever, you know, it, it's <laughs> worth it. 
But I think really the key is just to focus on something new and just constantly focus on something new. And also, you know, if you have friends or critique partners, or not even critique partners, that's a bad example, but people in a community who will read your books for you and be excited about them, that's important too, because you're gonna get, I, I got so many rejections. You're gonna get so many rejections. And, I mean, I hope not. But like, <laughs> realistically, you know, when you play the odds, there are going to be those, and it's, it's worthwhile to also find yourself, like surround yourself with some positivity at the same time, or it's just, it's gone. Yeah, um, that is great. That's, that's very practical and, and, and Thank you, great I rejected advice. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but there literally is no author on earth who hasn't been rejected, you know, a bunch of times. And it, one thing I think is helpful is to really understand what a rejection means and what it doesn't mean. Like, mostly, it really does mean I didn't connect with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, I mean, and you can't, you really have to do as, as much research as you can to send your book to somebody who you feel has taste like yours. Um, I think so, something that many authors um, haven't done uh, it is to really examine the, you know, the shelves uh, of book libra libraries and bookstores where you want to see your book and you know, taking, taking books from their, their shelves and said, oh, these are my favorite books, who are they published by? And then take another step and find out who edited those. You know, with, with, if you have the internet. Um, I've been using it. Yeah, but, but <laughs> as we have, not everybody does, right? right. Um, like my sister. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, not that one. <laughs> then you can, you know, there's, there are tools and there's research and you can dig further. Um, if you don't, you can look in the, you can always look in the uh, acknowledgements section. People mostly do thank their agents and they usually, they some, sometimes they thank their editors. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I'm saying this just as a, as a tool so that you're then, I, I, I guess I'm gonna shift perspectives for a second, because like when I first sent, started sending things out as an author, I would get back these awful rejections, and then I actually got to know some of the people who sent me those rejections. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not being catty when I say, now I'm like, of course she would like that. <laughs> you know, like, she does this kind of book. She would never like my kind of book. Um, and you're like, duh. Uh, that's how I was, you know. If you, you know, if you have an agent like Tamar Rosinski, you know, who actually does select individual people, I gotta say also that not every agent does that. Like, if you're, you have to spend as much, if you're gonna get an agent, you have to spend as much time choosing the right agent as choosing the right editor. Because a lot of stuff I get is sent to me and 50 of my closest friends at the same time. Um, I'm also a middle school teacher at a Jewish day school. And I'm curious whether any of your students or their families have read your work and how that has maybe changed your relationship with your students <coughs> or sort of sharing that part of your life with your students or their families. So I've been cautious so far. Um, there was a moment last year, the day that my book came out actually, when a girl whose father was friends with my father, she raised her hand in class, she raised her hand in class a lot, so I was like, okay, you know, Eliza, I said, Eliza, let's go. And she pulls out the book and says, my mother said to get you to sign this. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, but Surprise! The, it was, so there were like rumors about it, but I don't use my full name. Um, I use like a nickname of both my first and last name. Mm. So it's not immediately obvious. And the problem with Aviva is it deals with a women's mikvah. Mm. And that's something that some parents are not necessarily comfortable with their daughters reading about. 
So, at least in, in within the community, I think less so outside. I don't think they care outside. Um, or so, even know what a mikvah is hmm? outside. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my son didn't know either. He's like, oh, there are women's mikvahs? I said, <laughs> like, there are men's mikvahs too. And there are mikvahs for, like, objects also. He said, oh, okay. That was it. <laughs> but, um, but I think so. I've been, like, a little bit careful. Uh, slowly, like, as my coworkers' kids come into my classes, they know a little more. I find it sometimes, like, I'm almost a little bit sad about it because I see these girls who are sitting there and writing and they love to write and they love to read and I'm, I just like want to like inspire them a little bit. I want them to be like, yes, you can do it. You can go there someday, you know. But at the same time, like, I so far I've been keeping it, you know, separate. The next book I think is less objectionable. So, um, <laughs> so. so objectionable was not a word I ever <laughs> thought of. So kind of a follow up to that. It's gotten a lot of attention in the mainstream media and. Mm -hmm. Is really a wonderful book. I'm wondering if you've gotten responses from the firm community, if anybody is reading it, if they're responding to it, if they're how they're feeling about so it. So I've seen it within like the firm community that's online, mm -hmm. but not so much within the firm community that's like um, you know like the people I see every day. Like right. I have a friend who's a librarian, and I know she keeps giving it out to people, but she doesn't tell them who the author is. She just tells them it's a local author, mm -hmm. and at least they seem to be reading it and enjoying it. I think. Uh, I hope. Oh, you would uh, hear. Yeah, you would hear. Yeah, <laughs> we would hear. Yes. But my mother did take the book down to the local, like, Jadega Plus and hand them a copy and say, you know, you should carry this. This is my daughter's book. And they were like, okay, we'll take a look. And then we never heard back from them again. Yeah. <laughs> I think they probably would have gotten into trouble for having that book in their children. Yeah, section. I can't imagine so. Shopsies carrying it a lot more. Yeah, but you gotta take it to like Judaica House and Teaneck or something. You yeah, I've been to Teaneck. Oh, yeah. Teaneck. Yes, mm -hmm. place. That's a good place for it. All right, I'll butt in now because mm -hmm. I'm talking already. Um, <laughs> this is something that we touched on in the panel earlier about writing about religious characters. Um, I guess I'm curious like how you guys wrangled like the religious side of and like, not just about like, oh, she happens to like celebrate Hanukkah or something like that, which is like pretty, you know, mainstream in books and, and so on. But that, like, somebody's actual religious beliefs or like observances that people won't know about unless they read this book or unless they're inside the community. Like, how do you write about that? How do you like make sure that people can handle it? Because that kind of thing is extremely uncommon. Like, not just Jewish stuff. Like, I, I work in a very large Muslim minority community. And so I'm very on top of what comes out for my patrons. And there's not a whole lot that is, goes beyond the very surface of Islam as well. Um, I know exactly one mainstream book with a, like the evangelical Christian character even. Um, and so like, <laughs> I guess like- Was it when I published? Good name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was it, Aaron Hahn, I forget the word. Um, I forget the title now, I, I keep forgetting it, but yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so like just I guess writing about religion and how people responded to that, as well as just like oh, it's not just that she's Jewish. Like you know, you learn something about being Jewish that you wouldn't know unless you were in the inside. Like do, do people I don't, uh, do people comment on that? Was it hard to write? Was it hard to edit? I was very careful when I wrote the book not to specifically talk about God. Specifically, like it's funny, like the, a huge plot point is Kaddish. Kaddish is in there. Yeah. There's a lot of praying, there's a lot of cultural Jewish things and culturally religious Jewish things. But I, I remember, I think we discussed this, there was a, there was a bracha, a blessing oh, in there. Yes, and funny. I didn't want to say, blessed are you God. Like I just want to say, blessed are you. And it, like we ended up, I think, just switching it to the English. Yeah. Um, you know, and just cutting it out entirely because I felt that that was like one step too far. I felt like this is a, if we can, you know, learn about it as a cultural thing, that's fine. But I don't think it, you know, kind of the religion itself was cultural and solely cultural um, rather than, you know, bringing that in, which, uh, you know, oh, uh, which a, you know, a religious publisher <laughs> would not necessarily like about it, truthfully. But I felt that that was, you know, something that makes it, you know, much, much more of something that people can explore. It's not, I'm not proselytizing to you. I'm just telling you about my culture. And I mean, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this also in terms of editing. Well, uh, it's interesting. I never perceived this to be a problem or, um, you know, tricky part. I, I just reacted as I, uh, and I was very clear, um, I think, with, with Mari, this is my background. So, you know, I, I can only react from my background. And I would ask questions and say, you know, 
would you would this be would you say something about this is this is this right I do now I do suddenly remember the um, the prayer which uh, ironically we handle in a very reconstructionist fashion <laughs> um, but yeah I think I, I, I when I'm when I'm reading I, I just use who I exactly who I am as the reader and then I, I say I give that to Mari and say, "What do you want to do about that?" You know. I also love that you don't use italics. Yes. For, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's that is a uh, we decided that as a as a publisher that we are not gonna. It's a great policy. <laughs> yeah, and we put we did we did create a, a glossary um, in the back. Did we explain anything in the back? Like that was this is what this means. This is what this cult cultural. Maybe a tiny bit this here is and what there. Is. So we both went through it. We decided what was necessary. There was a little bit in the back, not, not a lot. Well, yeah, people can always look stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, it's just I don't. It's just not an obstacle. You know. I have a question for Mari. Um, did you ever think that in the process of getting rejected, that it may never make it into the mainstream literary world, and that you might have to resort to going with a Jewish publisher. And if that were the case, what would the implications of it being set in the mix? Yeah, I, did, I was, it was like either going to go mainstream or not at all, oh. <laughs> because I didn't think that a Jewish publisher would. Because again, they have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. They have to appeal to every single you know person who might pick up a Jewish published book. And there are not very many of them. So they really, like, they would not have taken it. So it was, you know, that was it. <laughs> this is revelatory to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my grandmother asked me all the time, but why don't you, you know, market it more to your students? You have all these, you know, built-in. And every time I say the same thing, it's about a mikvah. Maybe, maybe the next one. We'll see. <laughs> but, you know, it's, what can we do? And to me, it's set in a mikvah. Yeah. It isn't. But it's not about a mikvah. Right. But it's an important it. distinction. Right. Yes. Right. That's I mean, why I the, have that the, the, you know, there's, uh, I found there to be there to be scenes that were, it, that were, that gained meaning and resonance, um, like when when uh, Aviva immerses herself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, to me, I took that as a, you know, this this means something different to Aviva than it would to, you know someone else. Definitely. Um, Very scandalous, though, and then thought like that. <laughs> <laughs> also, and I have no way of knowing, you know, this is partly why I, you know, I have to trust uh, Mari, and I have to trust my sensitivity readers. Um, but I'm learning, I'm learning something, you know, today, even every conversation, you learn something. Anything else? Yeah. That part about feeling self-conscious um, around like uh, openly talking about your work, I kind of get because I'm a queer author and I have certain family members who don't quite get it. So like, how do you, I guess, navigate that? Like, how do you? I'm sorry. Pri like, self, your when private, if you're self-conscious about some element in the in the story, like like you're talking mm -hmm. about the mikvah, I mean. Like what if somebody came and fetched you about it? Like, um, you yeah. <laughs> I think that maybe the story is either not for them or parts of the story is not for them. And that's okay because you're writing for yourself. And I mean, I, that's such a trite thing to say. But you're writing first for yourself and then for others. And the people who, to who, with whom it resonates are the people who matter. Those are the readers who matter. The people who don't, the people who won't understand it, the people who can't connect to it for whatever reason, they're just not your audience. And that's okay. Not everyone has to be the audience for every book. There are a lot of books out there that I won't touch. And, you know, and there are a lot of books out there I'm sure that you won't touch. And not every book is going to mean something to everyone. And I think it's okay. I think that it's, it's hard sometimes to deal with, especially if it's a family member or like my best friend who um, I, so I showed her the book that I gave to you and I said, yeah, it's like kind of like a middle grade thriller. She said, it wasn't very thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just it's not a book for her, and you know, and I appreciate the honesty, but at the same time.
time, I think it's important to really surround yourself with people who are your audience, people who can connect with it, people who will connect with it, because those are the, those are the ones that matter. And, and I, I'll only add that you just can't anticipate every objection to your book. You know, you just don't even know. Like, so why, so why care? You know what I mean? I mean, if your parents, your family, it's a different thing. Um, but, you know, when you're writing, that's, that's not your problem. You know, when you're writing, you're, it's the characters and the setting and the plot is your problem. Not, not how people will react to it, specific or generalized. All right. Well, Mari, are you going to stick around for a few minutes and sign books? Yes, yeah, sounds like. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you all so much.